Brian Page is here. Brian Page is the world's leading authority on how to scale an Airbnb business. He's the founder of the BNB Formula and author of How to Become Financially Independent on Airbnb. You and I have worked together in a course that I have too, so I've known Brian here for a while. Uh, he's a lifestyle entrepreneur, business coach, a multi-million dollar brand builder, and host of the Digital Titans podcast. Uh, behind the scenes, he's partnered uh, with more mega thought leaders than anyone in his industry, like myself. Am I considered a thought leader? I think so. Okay, thank you. <laughs> uh, he's here to share how he launched a successful Airbnb business and how he's helped people in 38 countries to do the same. Brian, good having you here. Thanks, good to be here. You're the master. Let's talk about property hacking. Three ways that you hacked your way to $300,000 a year income and how you're teaching your students. You've got, what, one that's at a million dollars a year? Couple. Couple? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so, you know, growing up, I always thought real estate investing was something I saw on TV. I didn't grow up with rich parents. And I want to hear a little about your story too, but I always thought real estate was complicated. In the past 500 years, anywhere in the world, you had to buy the property for the most part. Mm -hmm. Airbnb and some other websites have changed the game, but they're not teaching this in school. Definitely not. So for anybody watching, like we're now going to teach you what they should be teaching in junior high, high school and college. But they're not going to, by the way. The system's not geared for that. So let's give people three things. Here's my goal from this. People are listening. People are watching. A lot of people are going to see this. I posted, I don't know if you saw, about two weeks ago I was in London. Mm -hmm. And I posted this article that I read about a guy who made, what was it? It's like 27 million or something. 15 million two years ago. And I think he's gone up. Yeah. Just doing Airbnb properties and property hacking in London. Yep. So I got a huge response. I posted on my Instagram. And... People were like, how do you do it? So I posted on IGTV and I gave people like a five minute synopsis. But I brought you here because you can give people like the complete breakdown. You've written a book on it. Yep. You're kind of known as like the guy around Airbnb and property hacking. So let's start with this. You've done it yourself because a teacher has to yep. do to be a good teacher. Like the best basketball coaches aren't just coaches, they like played in the league, yeah. right? Phil Jackson, yeah. Pat Riley, all this. So you played in the league. You've got, what, about 12 properties mm -hmm. that you still do that make you about 300 grand. Still doing it, yep. And, but now you've begun teaching people just because some people are good at teaching and you like it, right? You're a little bit it. like me. It's fun to teach and explain. And now your, your students are surpassing you. What's the best story of a student surpassing you? How long did it take them? I got so many stories. Okay, one of the ones that comes to mind is this young kid. He's 18 years old, lives okay. in Chicago, and uh, he took he went through my training and he started getting properties in Chicago. He actually moved there because it was such a good city to do short term rentals. Okay, I think he's from Florida or something. He went there and within a few months he had several listings up, and within a year he was doing about um, 250k. Yeah, net. Net. And now he's got a hedge fund. So he's making 20000 a month Yeah, 20000 a month with properties he doesn't own. He doesn't own any of these properties. Yeah. And now he has a hedge fund that approached him and said, we want to invest into what you're doing so you can get more properties in Chicago. So now okay. he has access to a couple million dollars. Yeah. And he's expanding and he's like 18 years old. So I love that story. And yeah. I have quite a few students that are doing well over six figures. For you, did you start out with good credit? Did you start out with a lot of cash in your bank? bank account or how did, how did it work for you? Well, for me, Airbnb was always a side hustle. It was, you know, most people see it that way. It's like something you do with a spare room, make a few hundred bucks or yeah. a thousand bucks a did month. Did you have a room that I you did. just rented I out? Did. Well, I was okay. a real estate investor for many, many years. Okay. Uh, I, right out of college, I got into real estate investing. I was a flipper and, and I flipped over a hundred properties and was doing that. And I was doing well up until the big crash. So in 08, right. crash, lost all so my you properties. So look, you looked amazing in 2006, seven. I look good. You were like the smartest was, person you know, on the block. Then 08 hit and boom. 20-something uh, millionaire doing well. And then uh, the bottom dropped out. I couldn't sell a single property. I was building a multi-million dollar house on the beach in North Carolina, okay. a spec home. Okay. I was gonna make a million on that one home if it had sold, but that was, uh, I just finished installing the pool right before the big crash happened. So oh, nobody man. wanted the house. I tried to sell it for what I had into it. Couldn't sell it. I couldn't <laughs> rent it because nobody was going on vacation in 08. If you remember yeah. how bad it was. Oh, yeah. 
So I was hemorrhaging money and, and uh, it was all a mess. So I basically came out of that whole real estate crash um, with no property. And of course my credit was So you were decimated. a millionaire in your 20s. Millionaire in 20s. And then, then, then down to not a millionaire anymore. I was a negative millionaire. Negative I millionaire. I don't tell the story very often, but I owed 1.2 million to the IRS. Wow. Now I don't know, but I owed one, I got a bill from the IRS for $1.2 million. But, and you didn't have the money. I didn't have the money. <laughs> so I was a negative millionaire. So the guy on the street was was a million dollars richer than me that was penniless. Yeah, homeless so person. Homeless person. I was like, you're lucky because you don't owe any money. Yeah. <laughs> so that's where I was. And and uh, and so I was just doing Airbnb in a two, two bedroom apartment where I lived and uh, was making a, enough money. So you would sleep in one room and then the other room you'd rent out. Yeah, you can rent the bed in the same room, which is kind of creepy that Airbnb still allows that. They allow that? You can that? do a bed, not a can, room, but a bed. Can you see the picture of the person <laughs> before you say yes to this? You should put like contingent. If you like, look like serial killer, you cannot sleep in my room. How hard up are you if you have to stay in someone's room on their, their spare but bed? But not the same bed, probably. Uh, I don't know, I don't <laughs> know. Some people on bed Airbnb. Share. <laughs> Who knows? You can get bunk beds. Bunk Man, beds, talk yeah. about creepy. Like Step Brothers. <laughs> talk about creepy. It's like there's a random dude sleeping above you. But you get the top. Now the bunk. question is, which one did you take, the top or the bottom? <laughs> if he's a bedwetter, you definitely want the top. <laughs> All right, so we digress. Rabbit hole. Yeah. All right, so I I had my spare room on Airbnb. I thought I was gonna make. Five six hundred dollars a month. I ended up making enough to pay for the whole apartment and all my utilities. Yeah. So I was working fifty hours. A week so that's at my a good job. thing for people watching and listening. That's is you can hacking. start with just your own if you got an extra bedroom. Yeah. Yeah. Don't go get an average place. Go get a really nice place in your city and yep. take the spare room, put it on Airbnb, and you can live for free. Yeah. So that's the first step towards financial independence for me was living free again. I, right. And I started feeling like, oh, this is what I used to experience as a real estate investor. I had cash flow. Yeah. And so that was working out great. And um, and I didn't really know what to do beyond that. I was like, I know I want more properties, but I didn't know how to go about it. And so it, uh, fate intervened. I was on a flight for work, sat ne down next to this guy who was very wealthy. He was a he, he buys. Uh, he's an early stage investor in the crypto mm -hmm. companies, and he he buys and sells companies. Super wealthy guy, and he asked all these questions about what I was doing, and I had no idea why this guy was so interested in me. Uh, it was nothing special. I wasn't doing anything special. But when we were done with the conversation, he's like, Brian, you. If you got a bunch of these properties, you, you can do really well. And I said, well, yeah, no, duh, but I can't buy these properties. I don't want to put 20% down. How do I do that? I mean, I don't get what you're saying. He's like, no, no, you don't need to buy properties. You just need to control properties. Hmm. And you can control them through leases. Right. You can control them through partnering with owners. And if you can control them, you can scale this thing. And yeah. that one idea, now keep in mind, this was years ago. Nobody was teaching this online. There were no YouTube videos. There's nothing about how to scale an Airbnb business. And so I went home, immediately got my first listing. And then from there, one listing every month and scaled it. You build it up to 12, you build yourself 20, $30,000 a month. I'm basically passive. But totally income. passive, yeah. I automated yeah. everything so I could work a couple hours a week. I automated all the day-to-day -day management. So you me. pulled off the four-hour work week. Yeah, the, the three-hour work week. Three-hour work yeah. week using Airbnb. It's like five-minute abs. I'm gonna, I'm gonna one up them and do the three-hour work. The three-hour. Why would you want to do four-hour? <laughs> four hours work week. Old. If you could do That's two and so a half. 2008. Yeah. So. Okay, so you got this. So I wrote down a series of questions sure, because sure. everybody wants to know like, okay, this sounds great, yep. but we, let's face it, we live in a skeptical world. Sure. I put, when I posted on my IGTV, somebody wrote, you know, cause I wrote about this guy that had whatever, 80 properties and he, or 200 properties and he's making 15 million. And yeah. the guy's like, oh, that's easy. I just get 200 properties and then I, so people feel overwhelmed. First of all, you don't have to do 200 properties. No, no. But let's just walk through. Let, let's just say, let's go back to when I was like, you know, growing up, I had no money, mm -hmm. lived in a mobile home, 19, 20 years old. What would be the first thing you would teach me? What would I do for like, let's actually like, you have a, an actual course where you mentor and teach people. Mm -hmm. Let's pull back the curtain. Sure. Cause that's a paid course. And these are, this is a free podcast and a sure. free video. Let's actually like teach people what you teach. Obviously your course is how long? It's like how many hours of training? It's a lot. That's a big, it's like a comprehensive 10, 20, 30 hours. video course. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. you know, we're not gonna be able to do like a 10 hour training, <laughs> yeah. but let's try to like give people so that people who don't get in your course even could just do this on their own. Okay. What? Yeah. Sorry. I'm getting... Okay. Here we go. 
So let's, let's pull back the curtain. You have a paid training program where you mentor people and, but this is a free podcast, free video. And I want to, I want people to feel like they actually learned how to do it on this video. So you've got whatever 70 video training program mm -hmm. and all that. Let's pull back the curtain. Pretend I'm 19 years old, just like I was. I lived in a mobile home, just had moved out, didn't have any money. What would you teach me about how I can basically, because kind of your formula is you pay $1,000 and you make 3000 mm -hmm. So you're like tripling your money. Yeah. So pull back the curtain. Like how does somebody listening, how do I in my 20 year old self actually do that? First of all, where do I go? Mm -hmm. How do I find the listings? How do I list it on Airbnb so that it's always full, mm -hmm. right? Like those three things. Um, how do you find them? And how do you manage them? And then how to automate it? That's also a great story. But what would you what would you tell me? Okay. Well, let's talk about first of all how it works. Yep. So let's take a typical example of a thousand dollar property. This okay. works whether it's you're in a three thousand dollar a month place or a five hundred dollar a month place. So don't pay attention so much to the number. So let's take a thousand dollar a month uh, rental, like yep. a one bedroom. And we're going to put it on Airbnb. And the reason that we can make three thousand dollars with it is because we're charging more per day or per night for somebody to stay there than what it costs us to control the property. Right. So if it's like $50 a night to control and we're charging 150 or 200 on Airbnb, then that difference is profit. Yeah. So an example is one of the properties I have uh, where I live in, in the Charleston area is $1,000 a month and it brings in between three and five a month depending. Mm -hmm. So and then I got to pay utilities out of that. But pretty much you're able to make that spread between what you're paying for it and controlling it for and what you're making on Airbnb. And it's the same game that hotels play. So hotels pay their mortgage, but then they chop up that property into rooms and each room is sold by the night. So mm -hmm. we're essentially buying wholesale, selling retail. It's no different. So that's what we're doing. And there's a couple different ways to do that. You can control the property through a lease where you get the owner to sign on and get permission from Is them. that the best case scenario? I love that because you don't give the owner any of the profits. The agreement yes. I have with owners is I keep all the profit and I just pay them what they're asking for. So they're already looking for a renter and I'm the renter. So you basically find properties that are for rent. Already for rent, already on the market. Yep. On the market. Mm -hmm. And, and where, do you look? Where, do you, where do you look to find them? Okay, there's a lot of places. I, I, I look online, you know, Craigslist surprisingly is still a great place to look, local papers. Mm -hmm. I do. Dr I drive through neighborhoods. Signs in yards for rent. Signs are I great places. Say, I thought you were going to say you do drive-bys. <laughs> I do drive-bys. I, I kill one way to control property. Give me these homes. You kill the owner and then you get it for free. <laughs> yeah, no. Driving through neighborhoods is good because you're trying to get to the owner, not the property manager. And usually, yes. an owner will will put a handwritten sign in the front yard so you know, oh, that's the owner. Okay. So I look. I drive neighborhoods. Uh, local real estate investing associations are great because. People there generally own a bunch of properties. Mm -hmm. So you get one, which leads into many properties. So you're basically presenting yourself as, hey, I'm the best tenant that you could lease this property to. And if you lease it to me, uh, I'll lease it for many, many years and uh, and essentially just pitch them on the idea of what you're going to do. So you you are open and honest. You tell them, look, I'm going to put this on Airbnb yes. because you don't want to surprise people. No, you will get then burned. They'll try, they'll you will get burned think if you, you break the your contract and push, kick you out. Yeah, they, they, they could or sue, sue you, you and they could, who knows. So, so, so do you have a front. special contract that actually, yeah. they actually sign saying they understand what you're going to do? It's an addendum. So yep. it's just a standard lease and then a one page addendum, essentially an add on that just says, uh, Brian Page is not going li to live in this property and he has my permission to put this property on the home sharing sites and let guests stay there. Yeah. And, uh, and so once they sign those two documents, then I'm good to go. Yeah. And so that's, that's the way I like to do it because I get to keep all the profit for myself. The other way is to partner. And that's right. just simply like, Hey, uh, Ty, I see you got a house here for rent. You're asking a thousand dollars. What if I get you 1500 or 1700 a month for that property with no extra work on your part? Yeah. Would you want to hear about it? Sure. Yeah. Tell me how that works. Well, I'm going to take your home, put it on Airbnb. I think it'll make 3000 3500 a month. We'll split everything over the $1,000 that you need to get for your for your normal rent. So you'll basically give I'll them what they would. Yeah. Guarantee yeah. you $1,000 and then 50 50 above that. Yeah. And if you don't like it, tell me to take a hike and in, in, in 30, 60 days, I'll walk and yeah. we'll, we'll part ways. So yeah. that's a great model to go. And you look for furnished properties if you're going to do and that. And that's a good way, especially for people who maybe 
don't have good credit and can't actually lease something. You don't need credit. You yeah. don't need credit and you're not even signing a lease. So yes. you don't need to sign any paperwork. So that lets you be able to walk away from it if you don't like you it. You can walk away. I mean, oh. you want to put an agreement together that says this is our agreement, but it's not a lease that ties you in for any period yeah. of time. So for anybody listening who's a little more fear-based, this is a good way to this start. This is the way to You make a little less money potentially because you don't control the property yes. and get all the upside. Because for you, if you rent it for a thousand and you can figure out like in high season, in South Carolina, when there's a lot of people vacation, you might make five or six thousand that yeah, month. Exactly. You can get lucky if the hotels are full and there's a special event in town. You yeah. can just jack the prices up yeah. in air, on Airbnb, big time. Yeah. I was uh, here, you know, here in New York, Atlanta, coming back from London, and uh, it's Fashion Week, and like it's everything insane. is jacked up. Even it's like Uber has their surge pricing. Yeah. You can do the same thing with Airbnb. You can surge, yeah. So, okay, what, let's talk about, I got people who follow me from every place on planet Earth. All over the US, obviously, but almost every continent. First of all, where do you find properties in terms of not within the city, but are there cities way better than others? Do people have to move? What if they live in Detroit, but want to do it in Chicago? Do you have people doing it remotely? Do you yeah. recommend people move? What about other countries, regulations? Okay, wow. Okay, okay that's yeah. a lot to unpack. I threw out like 66 questions. All right, 67 let me see if I can recall questions. this. All right, let's start first of all yeah. with international because I love talking yeah. about international. Um, there are, I have 38 countries represented, people that I've taught directly that have okay. gone through my training and that are- Because Airbnb is in how many? Airbnb is in every country but North Korea. Yeah, and, and I, maybe I, Syria right now. You don't North want to, Korea. You probably don't want. To, my target market is North Korea. I mean, Korea. I'm trying to crack in there, but yeah. you know, it's it's not a not a good market. Uh, pretty much 100. You need to talk countries. to Donald Trump. He's got a relationship <laughs> with Kim Jong Un. There might be some money there. Um, no, so it's in every country, and 75 percent, three of every four listings are not in the U.S. right now. Huh? So yeah, most. So of Airbnb listings, is bigger outside the U.S. Way bigger it, outside yeah. the U.S. and it's growing faster. And there's more opportunity outside the U.S. So I'll give you an example. A couple different trips. I, I, I go to several countries a year. I was on the 16 country tour, and I was in Egypt. And the guy that was giving me a, 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 a camel ride around the pyramids had an Airbnb. And huh. I asked him about it. He said, "Yeah, I make more money with my Airbnb than I do as the guide. Huh. So when I'm, you know, I'm bored, I come do, you know, guided tours." So he was doing camel rides for fun. He was doing camel rides, as but a, Airbnb side, was paying hustle. the bill. Yeah, Airbnb is paying the bill. So, so then I went to Costa Rica and was was whitewater rafting down this river, and the rafting guide pointed to this house right as we went by, beautiful house right on the like a thatched roof hut kind of on the river, and he said, "That's where I live." I said, "That's gorgeous, you know, this incredible river," and he said, "Yeah, I'm thinking about doing something called Airbnb. Have you heard huh. of it?" I was like, "Yeah, I've heard of it." You should have said, "You don't even know who you're <laughs> talking like, to right I was now." Like, I've heard of it. So I said, "How much do you pay in rent there?" He said, two hundred a month." Well, that's standard for Costa Rica, 200 a month. He said, do you think I can make money with it? I said, dude, I just paid $65 a night for the hotel down the road and it's a dump. Yeah. I would much rather pay you $65 to stay there and you can do the math pretty quickly and see how much yeah. that could be worth to him. He yeah. said, you'll make a fortune if you put that on Airbnb. Yeah. So there's huge opportunity overseas with, with this. So it does work in other countries. Um, really, the only thing you got to know is, is can you have access to the property? Can you get permission to use the property? Right. And if you can, you can put it on Airbnb. Now, in the U.S., aren't there some st cities that have some regulations that's yeah. tough? Yeah, so we're, that, that's a good one I want to unpack because this is something that most people do not teach. They don't even talk about it. Anybody who talks about Airbnb won't, won't touch this. Um, so we spent a lot of time doing research on what's going on with regulations right now because Airbnb is a huge disruptor, just like Uber. Yeah. You know, they were fighting it in Vegas. They wouldn't allow Uber in certain cities. And then Uber started winning all these cities. Well, Airbnb is disrupting not only the real estate industry, it's disrupting hotels. Yeah. And the cities that have the most powerful hotel unions and hotel um, brands, like New York City, for example, yeah. um, let's see, uh, San Francisco, yep. big cities like that, it's very difficult to do Airbnb in those cities. Yes. And so I spent a significant sum of money with a research firm to go through 2,000 cities in the US. We researched every city over 30,000 people and whether or not home sharing is allowed or not allowed. Yeah. We found 92% of them allow home sharing. Huh. So 8% are what I call red cities. Yep. Now that doesn't mean you can't do Airbnb if you live in those cities, you just simply have to go to the surrounding 
metro areas. Yeah, like if you're in San Francisco, you can go yeah, out. I've got students in San Francisco that are Oakland killing it. or something like that, or yeah. Yeah, Atlanta yeah. proper, but you can go to any of the towns around Atlanta. And the interesting thing is I have students that are doing it in those areas despite the rules because half those cities don't enforce the rules at all. Right. So I'm not saying you should break the rules, but there are there are people making a ton of money right. doing it despite the rules. And if you doubt me, just look up any city on Airbnb and you'll, sign, you'll find thousands of listings, including Manhattan, for example. Even the places you're not Even supposed to be doing. Even the places that are not So allowed. Airbnb is just like, it's you can post everywhere. Yeah. It, it's like a whack-a-mole, you, know? yeah. you know? So I, I think the best way to build the business though is to do it properly and do it in a place that you're not gonna ever be shut down, where it yes. is allowed, where it's unrestricted. And there's so many cities you can do that. And even if you're in a city that's restricted, like Manhattan, you could go out and in New Jersey, go or across the river, Westchester. Or something I got students in. I got students yeah. in New York. I got students in yeah. every major city. Yeah. yeah. So that's how you get around the regulations. You just go where it's allowed. The same way, if you're going to, uh, for example, open a, a business, if you're going to open a, a subway, you couldn't do it in a residential neighborhood. You'd have right. to go to where it's commercial. So it's it, it's zoned just like anything else in real estate. So okay. So next, so let's. I'm walking myself through this. Yeah. You've got the property. You found the location. You found somebody. You're either going to split with them or you're going to uh, own the lease or, or control the lease yourself. Mm -hmm. Next step is how do you keep it full? Because this whole thing, it's like a hotel. A hotel yeah. goes broke if only 30% of the time people are staying. In. So how do you get good at putting a listing on Airbnb? Are there other websites that you like to put? Because yeah. I know you kind of lean towards Airbnb. Yeah. Some people do VRBO and Homeway and different ones. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about the nitty gritty of like getting your first paying customer. Because really, sure. these are your paying customers. Yep. And then we'll, let's talk about that. How do you get them? Mm -hmm. And then we'll talk about how do you manage them. But how okay. do you get them? Sure. Well, Airbnb is by far the largest platform. Okay. I have used VRBO. I do like VRBO for, for high-end luxury properties and for truly vacation rentals. Most people think Airbnb is vacation rentals, and that's not true. Vac vacation rentals is a whole other thing. So if you're at the beach and you're renting a big house on the beach, that's a vacation rental. Right. If you're in a, um, you know, Des Moines and you're renting a two-bedroom condo, that's not a vacation rental. Yeah. So um, Des Moines? Not, you mean Des Moines is not a great place to vacation? <laughs> It's not a hot Oops. spot in the world. I got a lot of haters now in Des Moines. Like, Sorry. You, where should we go for the summer break? <laughs> don't go to Des Moines. Des Moines. <laughs> Miami? Des Moines. Yeah, don't go, uh, don't go there. No, That's I, a city I, that I've never I, been there, so I it's forgot. probably a lovely city. There's certain cities you forget actually exist in America. Yeah. Des Moines, it's like, have you ever met somebody? Where are you from? Des Moines. Des Moines. <laughs> Peoria. Or how about, how about Delaware? It's like <laughs> there's no one actually from Delaware. Yeah. There's corporations from there. A lot there. of corporations. But is, have you ever met somebody who's like, where'd you grow up? Oh, Delaware. Yeah. <laughs> Delaware and Rhode Des Island is even worse. Though. Rhode Island. Yeah. It's, but Delaware is big. Like Rhode Island, I understand. I it's think there's like 12 people place. in Rhode Island. 12 yeah. people, 12 actual people in Delaware and Rhode Island. Okay. So, <laughs> okay. We, so you like Airbnb. I like Airbnb. Okay. It's the largest platform. It has the lowest fees. Yep. Much lower fees. And you, quite frankly, you don't need any other platform to build what I, what I teach. So that's yeah. why I focus on so Airbnb. So keep it simple. Keep it simple. It's like... Yep. Like you could sell on eBay and you could also sell on Amazon, but you just do Amazon, you know, yeah. that kind of thing. So, um, so I like Airbnb as a platform. The cool thing is all the years I've done this and all the people I've taught, thousands of people, none of them, including me, have ever spent a dime on advertising. So okay. we don't spend any money on social media. We don't have to build a, w a website. We don't have to spend any money to get people in the properties. Airbnb does all that for us. Mm -hmm. So the key is to, uh, to have the best listing of its type in your area. Because yes. you're basically only competing with other Airbnbers. Yep. And luckily and thankfully, the vast majority of people, I'd say 98% of people on Airbnb don't know what they're doing. They so what do they do wrong? Bad pictures? I've seen some bad pictures Bad before. pictures. They, it's yeah, like dark. They, oh, yeah. Bad uh, bad staging. Yeah. They don't know how to stage a place as lovely as this, for example. Yeah. They, <laughs> they don't know how to stage it properly. They don't know how to paint a picture. Yeah. So, for example, if I have a place that has a view that I want to not just show the view out the balcony. I want to have the Wall Street Journal and a coffee and a croissant sitting out there. So it's like, oh, I could see myself sitting there. So it doesn't have to be super expensive. It doesn't have to be expensive. You can buy a croissant. It's staging. Yeah. You could pull a croissant out of the trash can yeah. outside of Bagel Bros if you don't have much money. Yeah. Put it there. Yeah. How much does it cost to get bath salts and a couple candles and put them around the jetted tub? There doesn't you go. It doesn't cost much. So just it's the same don't, thing hotels do. Just don't do. ingest the bath salts. That's <laughs> what <laughs> <laughs> no bath salts. Lay low on the bath salts. Um, so it's the same thing hotels do. When you see hotels and they look amazing on Expedia and then you yes. get there and you're like, wow, this is yes. a small room and it's nothing special. 
but they spent a lot of money on the photography. Yeah. Burger they, King, same thing. Oh, yeah. I, I saw, I had, a fr- <laughs> I had a friend and he's, there was like a new burger out. I forget where, McDonald's or some Burger King. And he went there and they served it to him and it did not look like the great picture. And he's like, <laughs> Came back and he's like, I want this. You know, I actually want this to look like, yeah, with the it's like his one was like, bling, <laughs> flattened. So you probably don't want to mislead people because then that's, you, no, you don't get want to mislead people on Airbnb too, yeah, right? No, if you get you too want many to show, complaints. No, you want to show what's there. Whatever yeah. you're doing, you want to show what's there, but you want to stage it properly. Lighting is very important. So we're lit right here. You yes. have to have it lit properly. You want to bring a professional photographer in, as we have a couple of these standing around. Yeah. You want to have a wide angle lens camera, not not an iPhone generally. Okay. And most people don't go to that trouble because it is a little bit more hassle to go get yeah. a photographer. Like I hired a photographer a couple of weeks ago, paid her $145. She's a real estate photographer. She yeah. came in, took her one hour, and the photos of that place when she was done, I mean, it was stunning. People were but it's like, cheap. Wow. 145 bucks might make That's you an extra night. five, six, seven hundred, eight hundred bucks a month. Yeah, you get one extra day yeah. in the next month you paid for your And you only have to do pictures once. You can pretty much use them for if you control the lease for years. You can years. do it once. Yep. Yeah. You can do it once. So photos are vitally important. Uh, studies show that you can get up to 300% more bookings with the right photos. So, you, so I'll give you an example. One of the condos I have is in a building with other condos and yep. it's a one bedroom. And the other one that's listed on Airbnb is a one bedroom in the same building, same floor plan. And I can charge $100 more a night for mine because wow. of the way it's staged, the way it's photographed, it doesn't even look like it's in the same universe as yeah. the other listing. And so when people are looking to book, they're like, do I want the $100 place or the $300 place? So I can afford the $300. I'm going to go with that one. And it's yeah. the same thing. It's yeah. just the way it's marketed and the way it looks. Yeah. So the furnishings are important. All those kind of things are very, very important. So I teach people how to... Do you try to get places that are furnished? Generally, I do. I always yeah. look for furnished places. Now, some cities, there's a lot of furnished places. In other cities, there's few. Yeah. So if you don't have a furnished property, then you do have to invest in the furnishings if you're going to go with a yeah. vacant unit. So pictures, massive. One good thing I tell people is everybody, if you can't even afford 145 bucks, you probably have a friend. Everyone thinks they're a good photographer and you probably yeah. have a friend who's a better photographer who already has a wide, uh, wide angle lens and, you know, a DSLR, Fucking like better. a better camera. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Um, so you come in. You light it, maybe bring some lights. I mean, you can get cheap lights. Yeah. Believe it or not, sometimes we have these little panel lights you can use, and you can just yeah. have a bring a friend with you to stand like a tripod, like a you know, yeah. say hold this like up this. and let's light this thing. It's not just lighting; it's it's simple things like I've seen photos of places where all the blinds are closed. Yeah. So every every window should be wide open. In fact, yep. I pull the blinds all the way up. Every light should be turned on. If you take a photograph of a bedroom and both of those lamps are off. Yes. That's not as inviting as having the lamps on. Yeah. It's it's you know soft lighting, all that kind of stuff is very, very And you important. have a book, right? That does it go over the some of this stuff? Um the course in the I, book? I basically talk about more the money side and the numbers side, but yeah, yeah I do have a book. Uh, yeah. Yep. We'll put it for those of you watching, I'm gonna put a link below yep. in the description. For those of you listening, just go to tylopez.com slash Brian P. That stands for Brian Page. B-R-I-A-N yep. and the letter P like Paul. Brian P. Okay, so you got the book, you have the course, because I know I'm gonna get yeah. bombarded with people going, <laughs> already the people, my, some of the people in the audience listening right now are like, I wanna do this, so. So, so the staging and all that stuff is yep. very important, but the numbers is really important, so let's talk about the yeah, numbers. Yeah, let's talk numbers. The pricing, the the day, how do you price it? Yeah, right? how do you price this thing? I like your model of, you just charge 300 when everyone else charges 100. Yeah. You can literally do that. It's the wild west, right? Well, it's it's kind of the the belief I have is anything will sell at the right price, right? Yeah. I mean, and anything will sell if it's the right price. So you want to test the marketplace. You want the marketplace to tell you what to charge. Yes. So I try to charge as much as I possibly can yep. every single week until the bookings stop. Yes. And when I hit that limit, I'm like, okay, I know 300 is the upper limit. Nobody's booking this place. And then I'll start lowering the price back down and see yes. what happens. And what I do also is on the vacant days, I slash the prices aggressively. It's the same thing hotels do, same thing airlines yeah, do. Yeah, airlines. Right, you try to book a hotel. Uh, yeah, some people are ticket. like, oh, is this ethical to change the price? I'm like, well, next time you're on an airplane, yeah. ask anyone sitting next to you. What did you pay? They did not pay the same as you. It's crazy. It's insane. And so hotels are the same thing. They're, it's called, they basically call it, you know, it's lo- they load Dynamic balance. pricing. Dynamic yeah. pricing yeah. is their thing, but I think of it as load balancing. They go, all right, this room, this section of the hotel has nobody in it. Drop the price. This yep. one, the suites are all being booked. Jack the price through the roof. Vegas does the same yeah. thing. So 
you keep it simple. You rent it for a week, let's say at 150 bucks. Mm -hmm. Then when the people move out, you say, oh, let me try 200. And then if it gets yeah. rebooked, well, what I do, what I do is I always charge more on the weekends, significantly more, because okay. on Airbnb your weekends are going to fill immediately. Okay. So I charge more on the weekends. How much more? Um, like on a hundred. Well, for example, if I'm charging 150 on a weekday, I'll charge two to 225 on the weekend, maybe 250. So you'll go up maybe 50 percent. 50 percent more on a weekend. Yep. And what I'll do is, let's say I'm listing a property for the first time. I just listed a property two months ago, and it was brand new. I didn't know it was in a neighborhood where nobody had any Airbnbs, and I'd never been in that neighborhood. And I listed it, I just said, I'm gonna just pull a big number out, like $300 a night, and, and see if anybody books it. Well, I had like two bookings for mm -hmm. over the course of the next 60 days. And I thought, well, that's not very good. So I let it sit for another few days. And then I lowered the price to 275. Now I got more bookings. Mm. So now I, I suddenly got like, say the next 30 days booked. I'm happy with that, 30 days yeah. out is fine. So I know it's around is that 275. Is kind of 30 days out? 30 days out, because what I don't want to happen, this is the biggest mistake people make, is they'll pick a price and then they'll, their calendar will have it open. And yeah. then suddenly all the weekends get booked out for four months. Yes. And I'm like, they're like, I'm so excited. I'm like, that's not a good thing because you yeah. probably underpriced those weekends if they yes. booked out that fast. And also sometimes you're gonna lose out on the weekday. Someone just yeah. took the cream, they took the dessert and yeah. you're left with the vegetables trying to sell the vegetables. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So you know the weekdays are going to fill not as fast. And so let's say the, the weekdays start filling up at $150 a night. And then I have this, this, this uh, 10 days on my calendar that I can't fill. Well, most people would just let that go and they lose that money. But what I'll do is I'll cut the price even further. Mm. So if I charge $100 a night on a unit that I'm getting as much as $300 for or $275 for, I will have gained another $1,000 a month on that. Yeah. So you can charge less and make more. Yeah. It doesn't matter what you charge. It only matters what you bring in. And any yes. vacancy you have, you're making $0 that day. Yeah, hotels, like in the hotel business, I have friends in the hotel business, all they're tracking, their key metric occupancy. is occupancy yes. rate. And they're trying to stay up in the 90s and things like yep. that because you start getting down in the 60s and 70s, that's yep. the break-even point. Yeah. You're just making back your costs. You're not making a penny. Well, the average right now, according to AirDNA, which is a data research company, is around 63% yep. of days will get booked. Which isn't good. Which isn't good. Now, my students are up in the 80s on yep. average, and I'm up in the 90s plus for most of my listings. Yeah. So that that's all... Because really, the profit is like probably starts kicking in around sixties. You can 70s, still be profitable 80s. there, yes, yeah. but, but you're not wildly. Profitable. You're not wildly. That's yeah. like that's like making eight hundred dollars a month on a small one bedroom unit versus making eighteen hundred on a month yeah. or two thousand a month. Yeah. Yep. Or more. Or more. So, we've gone into where to look for properties, how to list them, how the heck do you manage all these people, and ideally automated because you've got twelve properties. You guys said you're you're looking at what another 15, 16, look 17? At a package of seventeen. So you don't want to go crazy because obviously when you're managing the Airbnb, people are annoying. They're like, I can't get in the room. Where's the key? Yeah, it's dirty. Blah blah. blah. I mean, I can imagine all yeah. of a sudden you're almost like babysitting people. So how do you manage that in a scalable way that also you life is not just about making money. It's also making money with a good quality of life. Of course. So what's the automation secrets? Okay, so. When you have one or two listings on Airbnb, it's it's cute, it's fun, it's easy to manage. When you start getting five, six, 10, 15 listings, it gets to be a lot of work. And yes. essentially what you're doing is you're running a hotel, but it's a distributed hotel. So instead of rooms all in one place where it's easy to manage, you've got rooms all over the city or in multiple cities, multiple states, you're trying to manage all these things. And that tends to be a job. So you have people mm. that are messaging you. They're, they're, first of all, they're reaching out to you to say, hey, will you take a discount on these days? Or will you allow me to book? Or can I bring my my Shih Tzu with me, or you know, all kinds of random stuff they'll reach out to you about. And so you gotta accept or deny their bookings and their requests. Then when they come stay in the place, they're gonna have questions, you know, like where do I go to find a cool restaurant? Or, or you know, what's the address again? How do I get in? Where's the key? All that kind of stuff. So when you do that multiplied by, let's say eight guests checking in out of eight properties every single day, it ends up yeah. being a lot of work. Just the messaging yeah, yeah. itself. Now you have to coordinate the cleaners. So yep. the cleaning crew has to come in and they got to be coordinated. And then what if something breaks? Who's going to take care of that? Who's going to fix something if it breaks? So all these things have to be managed. Or if they trash it, or they... Or if they uh, trash it. Well, it hasn't happened. Knock on, knock on uh, fabric, but... Um, <laughs> but <laughs> That's so, good. So nobody's, a, nobody's trashed No, I've, I've had messy guests. In fact, I've almost... I don't think I've ever heard of a student that said, look, somebody destroyed my Does property. Airbnb have an insurance policy they helping do. you? So that's nice. They like, have a $1 million 
host protection insurance where they'll pay out. But I recommend going a step beyond that and getting actual insurance. It's very inexpensive. Privately. Yeah, you get uh, short-term rental insurance. On each property that you're controlling. On each property, and you, and you make the owner the beneficiary, so they're protected. Right, so if somebody accidentally destroyed, the whole place burns down, place on yeah, fire. it's paid for. Yeah. I have a property that I had um, in La Jolla, California. This was an Airbnb, Yeah. and um, my property manager, who's a friend of mine, Joey, he came and he said, listen, Ty, they were just diagnosed with cancer, the husband. They can't pay the rent. So I said... He said, we're going to have to evict them. They haven't paid the rent. And I said, you know what? Let's be nice. They asked for a little more time. I gave them a little time. I gave them time. Gave them time. I ended up giving them the whole summer. I could have rented it yeah. out. And finally, we're like, listen, it's been three months. August, you, you're going to have to get out. They trashed the whole place. Oh. Spray painted. What's the saying? No good deed goes unpunished. I was yeah. going, no one else in America will just give you three months summer in La Jolla. It's a nice area. Yeah. So I'm glad that with Airbnb, I wonder if people feel more accountable. It's a mentality. Yeah. It's a mentality of ownership versus non-ownership because a tenant feels like they own the property, yes. even though they don't. They're like, this yes. is my space. Yep. It's my, I got a year here. I got forever here. That's, and, a, and a guest doesn't feel that way when they're staying for two days. They're Plus just like, Airbnb be probably has their credit card. Airbnb has a credit card. I could see Airbnb going after people if they smash Well, they it. will because you can charge a deposit. So I can request a $500 hold on a credit card. Okay. And that hold's not released until two days later or three days later. Do you when, do that? Oh, I do. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, occasionally. I do it um, if I'm going to allow pets. I'll do a pet hold yes. or a deposit on that if there's any damages. Somebody's like, can I bring so, my grizzly bear? You're like, <laughs> like uh, yeah. yeah. So there, you, can, you can do $5, a deposit. $5,000. Yep. Okay. So that's a good little, little side tip. So... What else? Allow okay, so how do you automate all the okay. phone calls, all the maid services, all this stuff? Because people listening, I know my followers and listeners, they want to scale this thing up and at least make ten grand a month. Yeah, right? of course. And that way they can quit their nine to five job. So that was my goal. That was your goal. That was my goal when I started out. That's yeah. a good goal. I mean, ten thousand dollars a month. Put it this way: the average doctor in America, believe it or not, makes one hundred twenty thousand dollars a year. Yep. So if you can. And that's somebody who went to 10, 15 years of medical school and college. Has a lot of debt. Yeah. And, and look, I'm not saying you shouldn't. We need more doctors in the world. I'm happy for everybody who does that. I'm just giving you a comparison that yep. we're laying out here for free on this po this episode, like how you can make a doctor's income realistically. Yeah. Um, and you've had people build this in less than a year, right? Less than a year. Actually, let's break it down. $100,000 divided by 12 is roughly eight. Thousand three hundred thirty-three dollars. Yes, you could do that with four properties. At yep, a little over. So two. you only need four properties. You could do it. Well, you, let's say you made less than two thousand dollars a property. You could do yep. that with six properties. I've had students that have done it with two, where they're making four grand and four grand per yep. month net. So we're not talking a lot of properties to do this. Yeah, to get to six figures if that's your goal. So so, but you you want to scale it even more than that, I would hope, if you, once you start doing this. But what happens is you have all this management, essentially. And mm -hmm. I was so excited to quit my job. I quit after about the fifth listing. I quit my job. And I thought, okay, I got all the time in the world now. But then it started creeping back. This business started taking more of, my, more of my time. So I started thinking, okay, how can I emulate the hotel industry? Everything I did was based on the hotel industry. I'd look at what they're doing and try to do the same thing. And I said, well, you know, hotels have a front desk. I don't mm. have a front desk. And I need a front desk manager. Mm -hmm. I need somebody. So what can I do? Well, I could create a virtual front desk. How would I do that? Well, I need somebody that can message these guests back, coordinate with the cleaners, do all these different things. And I started looking around. And I found out there were actually services that do this. Hmm. They'll take like 5% of your, your income on Airbnb, and then they'll manage it all. So okay. there's services that do this. There are also VAs. There's a yep. lot of VAs now that specialize in doing nothing but managing Airbnb. So you can go on to Upwork. Yeah, you find a VA. So you go to Upwork and you search Airbnb management. Yeah, and you'll find people pop VAs, up. VAs, by the way, stands for virtual assistant. Yeah, virtual assistant. Know. Yeah, yeah. So virtual assistant. So this is the way everything's going nowadays. You could, you don't have to get a VA in the states. You can get somebody in the Philippines, Philippines yeah, or whatever. As long as they speak so, English. Yeah, yeah, they need to speak English, and they probably need to be able to get on the phone once in a while. And so you, you essentially you teach them how to do the management that you do. Now, do you put? a phone number that everybody gets in an email that says, if you have questions, 
call or email this number? Do you I'm do a little live kind of, chat. Well, Airbnb requires that people be able to text you and call you, so you yeah. have to have a phone number in there, but it doesn't have to go to you necessarily. So you don't put your phone number. What I do is I tell people, please don't call me or text me, message me through the app. That's the best way yes. to reach me because I want to teach them to go through the app, which is going to be watched by my VA, for example. So Airbnb app. They message you directly. People. Yep, direct and it messaging. has a whole internal system, and you can give virtual assistants access to that. You give them access. And how now, many does it? How many VAs does it take for? Let's say you've got twelve properties. Do you need one full time that you're paying five grand a month, two grand a month, three one, grand? One, and it's yeah. you know twenty, thirty hours a week. Yeah. Times whatever you're paying them, five dollars an hour, ten dollars an hour, fifteen, yeah. depending on what you're paying. So it's costing you a thousand bucks or it's, something a month. It's not much at all. I, yeah. I, what I've found is across my business, it takes about five percent. So ninety-five cents of every dollar I get to keep if I outsource. I'd rather uh, pay five cents and do nothing than make a uh, hundred cents on every dollar and do it all myself. Yeah. So so I'm always looking to outsource and automate everything. And by the way, if you click the link below, you go to tylopez.com/slash Brian P. That'll redirect you to specific information because there's a whole list. You can get of, my book. Yeah, yeah, you can get the book, the VAs. It'll give you, we talked yeah. about contracts, mm -hmm. um, the addendums. You give some samples of that in your course and things yep. like that. Yep. So and, and the list of all the 2,000 cities that you've researched mm -hmm. in the U.S. I'll show you the specifics. Um, and in yeah. my book, I break down, I show you each property, the specific numbers, what yep. I'm netting on them, exactly all that stuff. Yeah, so tylopez.com slash Brian P. Grab the book. Um, okay, so now we kind of got a complete system. Let's mm -hmm. talk about, let's take devil's advocate here. Sure. Let me be the devil's advocate because we all, everybody in this world has become more and more cynical. I'm not sure why. The world's actually better. There's more millionaires now than any time in history. There's more people making sick figures in a, every country in the world than there's ever been, but still. It's evil capitalism. That's what the problem is. Yeah, cynicism <laughs> is up, okay? So let me play the cynic here for a second. Okay much as that pains me to do because they're, they're the thorn in the flesh of, of people like you and I that are like optimists and be like, hey man, you can always see the down, you can always see the cup half empty. It's like, if you go down, I tell people, be careful going down that route because what you focus on happens. Sure. You know, it's kind of like if you're dating someone, the second you start focusing on their flaws, it's not going to be long until you're going to break up. Mm -hmm. because everybody has annoying things about themselves. So, And the biggest limitation is belief. It's not yeah. opportunity. Because look Always at this. Belief. This is like Airbnb. This is the most legit thing. It's one of the largest, fastest growing companies in U.S. history. Mm -hmm. You're using a platform that is in no way a scam, but people are still going to think this is a scam. So, of course, devil's advocate. Mm -hmm. Number one, I don't think I can convince somebody to do a profit share with me. Let's yep. say I'm uh, I'm Ty, I'm broke, I have no credit in this, or my name's Bob, let's not say Ty. I'm Bob, I got no money, no credit, no down payment. I'm not gonna be able to lease a place. And I don't know what to say to somebody. Mm -hmm. Okay. Like, I'm, let's say I'm 19 years old. How do I walk up, hey, will you let me control your property and I'll split the money with you? Like, how do you convince people do you give them a flyer? Do you show them a, a slideshow PowerPoint deck? Do you just go in and read a script to them? Do you email them? Do you try to talk to them in person? What's what okay. do you say? Well, I, I um, was a landlord for many, many years as a real estate investor. Had a whole bunch of units that I was renting out long term to people. So I know what it's like to be a landlord. And I had to kind of put myself in the shoes of other owners because when I first started meeting with people, I generally got no's 99 times out of 100. People were like, nah, I don't want to do that. And I was trying to ask myself, well, why? And I would ask them that. I would say, why? You know, I don't, don't mind me asking. I'm not trying to convince you. Just tell me why you said no to me. And they would say, well, here's the reason or here's the objection. And what I started thinking, the more people I talked to and the more I thought about what I wanted as an owner, I was really only looking for two things. If you can convince me that you're going to pay the rent on time with no hassle yeah. and my property will never be damaged and right. kept in impeccable shape, I will lease to you. And yeah. I generally will lease to somebody like that. So all I had to do was convince an owner that, that not only will I do those two things, but I'm the best selection of any of the people that are calling them. And then I give them several reasons why. So I give you, a, I, I like to play the tenants versus guests game. Yep. So we'll do this right now. So I'm, I'm gonna say a statement and you say uh, whether you think it's a, a guest or a tenant. In other words, a, somebody signing for a year that would most likely do this. So somebody, um, let's say, works on their car in the driveway and spills oil everywhere and takes the wheels off and leaves it there for six months. Is that going to be? Yeah, that's a tenant. That's a tenant, right? Not an Airbnb Not guest. Not an Airbnb guest. It's probably Ubered in, right? Right. 
somebody's uh, dog destroyed the backyard, filled it with holes over the course yeah, of the year. Tenant, That's not a tenant, guess. right? I don't allow pets in, in most of my listings, so you can't bring your dog there. Um, somebody refuses to leave the property. Right. You have to evict them. For sure, tenant. You, you never have to evict an Airbnb person yeah. because there's no lease. There's, they don't have yeah. any right to that property. They're a guest. Yeah, so nobody says, hey, I've been here two days. Yeah, you, you, you got to evict me now. Police will put them right you out. You got to evict yeah. me now, yeah. yeah. So that doesn't happen. And then um, let's say somebody starts modifying the property. They start painting the interior weird colors. They start you know, removing right. things, remo you know, changing things about the house without permission of the owner. Yeah, that's all. Put a tenants. satellite dish on the roof. That happens yeah. all the time. That doesn't so, happen. So basically what you're saying is you so tell I, people a tenant's way more dangerous in many ways. Yeah. I say, look, my guests are, are going to respect your property and it's going to be kept to the kind of condition that you've never seen before because every couple of days I'm going to bring my cleaning crew in. Right. And you get to come in too. If you yeah. want to come in and see your property on Wednesday, come on in because I have a, I have a tenant, window. You usually don't go see the property for one year. They could be very- You have no yeah. idea what you're in for when you go back and look at like Man, you did. I, I, ha I have a property still in North Carolina and I rented it out to this guy who was a kind of a friend of mine, acquaintance. I went in there, I was living in California. Never in the history of planet Earth have you seen a nastier place. So I walk in and I'm like, there's some kind of a smell here. Maybe he's like the next door neighbor has like nuclear waste or something. <laughs> But what I opened up the dishwasher, Ugh. it was like cracked and hundreds of flies came out of it. It was <laughs> maggot infested. He would just- Like eight mile? Yeah, he would eat <laughs> and then put it in the dishwasher, but not turn the dishwasher on. I'm going, what retarded brain? I mean, you just, the hard part is putting it in the dishwasher. He was, there was stuff in there for weeks, months. So I, um, I had, I got him out of the place and I hired a cleaning crew and I was like one lady and she was like, I need like help. <laughs> She's like, this place has got to be fumigated. <laughs> has suit. But that would have never happened with a guest because that's a good point. So you basically tell people, let me control your property. We'll do it on a profit share or I'll lease it from you. It sounds scary that I'm going to let Airbnb people in, but yeah, they don't. They're not there long enough, and I'm sending a cleaning crew every three, two, three, four, five days. Yeah, your property will look like these beautiful photos that yeah. I'm making here every time, every day. And, and yeah, because it's also in your best interest as yeah. the property hacker. I won't make you any money. You don't want the place to get destroyed, or else you're not gonna be able to re rent it out. So your interests are aligned. Plus, you could, do you ever mention that Airbnb has? A million I, dollar policy. I do. I mentioned that. And I also tell them, look, I'm still going to commit to you for a year. So if I sign a lease with somebody, I will commit to you for a year. Right. These guests aren't going to pay you the rent. I'm going to pay you the rent. So you don't have to worry about that. Um, and then uh, and then I tell them, look, your property is going to be covered by the host protection insurance because Airbnb gives every single host a $1 million coverage on, their, on, on yeah. of insurance. And then above and beyond that, if you'd like me to, I can insure your property. And I don't offer this unless they ask. But there's insurance companies now, that's all they do is they do short-term rental insurance. Yeah. So for 50 or 80 or $100 a month, which isn't really that much if you're, if you're making money on these properties, you can fully insure the property. Not only for if somebody were to burn it to the ground or damage the property, but for liability. Yeah. So somebody sues the Falls owner. down the stairs, something like that. Yeah. yeah they, whatever. They get does the Airbnb million dollars cover that? The million, no, That's I don't believe that damage. does. And yeah. they don't call it insurance anymore. And anybody in the insurance industry would say it's not insurance. It's, it's like, Airbnb uh, dis discretionary money that they can use for right. whatever they decide. And they have, uh, they do cover for most damages. But so, so basically I tell them, look, your property is going to be covered. And then I would ask them a question like, when was the last te time a tenant um, told you that they would insure your property with their own, you know, pay for it themselves, have it professionally cleaned two or three times a week? And I'll also take care of the minor maintenance. Yep. So I'll tell them oh, that so too. So I'll offer that. So I'll offer that. I'll say anything under hundred dollars, I'll cover. So if the toilet gets clogged, I'll never call you. If something small breaks, whatever, I will, won't call you for those things. I'll take care of them. Yeah. Now, why would I do that? Because I know I'm going to make money on that property. If I'm making two grand a month on a property, what is it? What's the big deal if every few months something breaks and I got to pay somebody to go over there and fix it? So you it? tell them major stuff they're going to have. Major to do. stuff they still cover. Yeah, I'm yeah, not going to repair. Roof caves in or something. They're yeah. Leak, roof leak, air conditioner doesn't work, they're going to cover. Yeah. Exactly. So, okay. So that's a good. So answer. I walk through those things. So by the yep. time I'm done, if they're just willing to hear me out, they're like, wow, okay, that, that is a, that is interesting. I got to consider this. 
And if, even if they don't do it at that point, then I might say to them, hey, I'll pay you a little bit more money. Yeah. You're asking a thousand, what if I gave you 1200? And, and they, that'll usually cinch the deal. But, he, but I don't really care if four out of five people say no to me because yeah. it's not a big deal to set up five appointments on a weekend on a Sunday, go look yep. at five properties and one person says, yeah, I'll do it. Yeah. So it's just a numbers game. It's a numbers game. It's a numbers do game. Do you ever approach people by email or you prefer in person? I've found that it does not work because yeah. they, remember they've got all these emails coming in from truly prospective tenants that are like, hey, yes. I want to see your property on Saturday. Yes. And then you're sending them something else that they're like, wait, I don't, I don't get it. So I don't ever like to pitch them over the phone or on email, only in person. And after I built rapport with them. Do you ever work with realtors? Find a realtor and say, look, every property you find me and get me in front of the landlord, I'll pay you. If they're my friend, I do. But most okay. realtors don't get it. And they look at it as too difficult to explain to an owner. Right. And they don't want to do anything that it requires extra work on their part. Yeah. And they'll butcher it. They'll go to the client and they'll butcher you trying to That's explain That's an to opportunity, them. by the way, for people listening that are realtors. Specialize. Specialize in helping match up Huge. people like you, yep. property hackers, with landlords. With landlords that are on the MLS with rentals. Certainly. And take a cut. And the other new thing, this is something that I haven't talked about before, is the super awesome source for finding properties now is to go look at properties that are on the market. Yes, for sale. And, and offer to lease option yes. them. There you go. Yeah, so, okay, I have a, a student, um, a guy who follows me named Tony. You might have met him, Tony Galena. And he, I actually, me and you, we you teach in my yeah. um, home HSMC. sharing. Yeah, HSMC, home sharing management company program that I have on tylopez.com. And also, Tony's one of the teachers. This is what he did. He went down to, I think, Destin, Florida, mm -hmm. somewhere like a little vacation spot in Florida, not Miami. He bought a house or he did a lease option for 300 grand. He's going to pay it off in under three years. <laughs> Nothing. Yeah. I mean, most landlords will buy a property if they can pay off using the rents in 10 years. He's going to do it, he says, conservatively three, maybe two years. My most recent property I purchased, I'll pay off in two years. Yeah. So you do months. a lease option. Yeah. By the way, if you don't know what that is, you go into a property that's for sale. You say, listen, I'm not quite ready to buy, but I'll lease it and a portion of my monthly rent, if I decide if I, yep. to buy, will be credited towards that, and you can generally decide on a price ahead of time. You decide ahead so of time. So if the market yeah. goes up, sometimes you have to pay, I don't know if you're having to pay a little lease option premium. Then. It depends on how motivated yeah. the person is, yeah. yeah. What about for people who lease options too complicated? Because that is a great That's way to start. That's a more advanced way. But the cool thing with the lease option is there's zero risk other than the money yes. you put down. So I can say, hey, Ty, I'm going to give you $100 for this option, yep. which gives me the right to buy your property for $300,000 up I mean, to two years from now. Yeah. And you're like, yeah, I'll take that deal. So I have this lease and I, every month I pay you for the lease. And then two years from now, that property's worth three. 40, 350, whatever. Yeah, you locked it in. And I locked yeah. it in. Now, when I get out of my b, &B I just yep. made 30 grand after paying the realtor or something. So um, I have And a, if the property value goes down, if there's a recession, there's you no walk risk. away from the lease. You walk away. It's an now, option. Yeah. what about going to, land, to uh, people who have properties for sale? If you don't want to do a lease option, just going, you look for properties that have been on the market too long, eight months ago, listen, this thing ain't ever going to sell. Let me start making you, you some profit. Oh, yeah. And you look just, for stale listings. Yeah, stale listings. There's lots of stuff that's been on the market for six, 12. I mean, there's stuff been on the market more than 12 months. And you know what we do is a lot we, of places. we look for places that are furnished because we see it in the listing. It's yep. already furnished. So now we have a furnished property that's sitting vacant, not making them any money. Yep. And we say to them, if you're not willing to lease it to us for the full time, why don't you just lease it to us for the weekdays? Yeah, because then on the, weekends, on the weekends they do. That's what I was going to say. Open houses and are it's free money. On Sunday. It's, it's free money for them, yeah. free money for us, no long term commitment. And, and you it, say, we'll make sure it's cleaned. You just give us a yeah. 30 day notice so we can, if we have uh, bookings, we don't accept bookings more than 30 days out. Right. We cancel and walk away. And usually, if they actually sell the property, things usually take more than 30 days. Usually, close. generally. You know, yep. So that's a whole close. other source of properties. So somebody asked me, don't you think they're going to, there's enough? Uh, are you running out of properties? Are there enough properties to do Airbnb with? And I said, there are millions of properties every day coming on the market, yeah. not only on the market for sale, but on the market for rent. And, and the, the only people getting hurt by this is the hotel industry. Yeah. Yeah, the hotel industry is not happy. Because people ask, what's the catch? Like, Brian, Ty, if you're talking about this, one, why isn't everybody doing it? My answer to that is simple. People are sheep. They take a long time to catch things. Why, why doesn't anybody do anything? I remember the yeah. first time I tried to flip a house, I, I told my friends I'm going to make 
35, 40 grand on my first flip and they were like, it's not easy, everybody would do it. Yeah. And I did it and then I, that was my full-time job was flipping houses and I said, I just made 35 grand on my first flip and they were shocked. But the, the reason not everybody does it is people just won't do it. I mean, yeah, people are, la- the simple reason people lazy and procrastinate and yeah. don't have common sense. Yeah. The other thing is that, the other reason is that um, people, if you understand psychology, there's something called commitment consistency bias. If you mm-hmm. look at Sigmund Freud, you know, he talked about the ego, the id, the super, you know, there's all these parts of our personality. And one of them is the story we tell about ourselves. Mm-hmm. So what happens is traditional real estate investors, they've built up their life. Their friends perceive them as like, I'm the guy who buys and flips properties. Yep. They watch the TV shows. Yep. They identify with that. When something new comes, people just blindly let it go by. Mm-hmm. I was reading the story about John D. Rockefeller, who became the richest man in the world. $600 billion in today's dollars. Yep. I mean, this guy had more money than Bill Gates, Jeff Bezos, Buffett. Everybody combined yep. were like juniors to him. And what he did, oil came out. Yeah. Okay. Oil was found in Western Pennsylvania. But back then, nothing ran on oil. There was no cars, no airplanes, no plastic. So uh, people lit their houses with whale oil yeah. and there's kerosene and kerosene was a byproduct of oil. So he started selling kerosene. Now you would have think the whole world would have caught on, but no people who already had their whale oil supplier. Yeah. The big fat cats that are rich. Yeah, on they whale do oil. it. They're like, well, it's been good enough for the last 20 years. I'm going to keep lighting my house with candles and whale oil. And John D. Rockefeller said, no, I've got something better, petroleum. Then there were steam engines. And he was like, well, let's do combustible engines are going to be more powerful. Henry Ford. Mm-hmm. People are still like, nah, you know, horse and buggy and all that. So there's always a window of, for Rockefeller, there was a window from, let's say, after the Civil War, 1870 to early 1900s, 20, 30 years, where nobody saw the trend. Now, yeah. here's the good news and the bad yeah. news. You don't have 20 or 30 years to get on the Airbnb thing because people are getting more savvy. Because it's still, We're still early in the wave because Airbnb is about but Five 10- years from now, it's not going to be as easy. Everybody's yeah. going to be doing this. Yeah, Airbnb is, is about 10 years old. It's really only gained its huge momentum in the last five years, yes. I would say. And, and it's still growing rapidly. Even, I would say even now. Maybe even less. I yeah. would say in only in the last year, consistently have my friends gone... I'm not going to get a hotel. I'm going to yeah. get an Airbnb. A year or two ago, well, you the, go to the London. awareness is widespread. But if you ask ten people, have you stayed in an Airbnb? The, the numbers right. are still very, very low. There's a um, there is a book everyone should read called Crossing the Chasm. It's a mm-hmm. very famous book. They make you teach, read it in business school. You know, I didn't go to business school. My friends who went to business school told me. And and there's early adopters, but most people are pragmatists, and they will only do something. When two or three of their friends have the done the laggards, yeah, as they call them. Yeah. So basically, the average person hasn't done Airbnb yet, mm-hmm. but they have two or three friends who have. So now is right now, literally. And those friends probably have a room on Airbnb, which is not the same thing. Right, that I'm not teaching. the same. It's not what I'm teaching. But 1999, 2019, 2020, mm-hmm. that's your window to do this. Maybe 2021, because yeah. you can come in, no, landlords are wide open. Yeah. The second more landlords start getting approached by this, they're yeah. going to get pickier and go, okay, When well, the tide changes and all the landlords oh, say, yeah. oh, no, I'm doing it myself. That's right. Which is and not land- happening right now, but it will. It will. And, and I was just talking about this in the car over here. I was driving with a friend of mine. We were talking about how every great idea sounds stupid before it's not. Yes. And we was talking about Groupon because uh, he got approached by this company that said, hey, we want to do, take this, these coupons and we're going to do them digitally. And he's like, well, that sounds stupid. It ended up becoming Groupon. Yeah. And I said, well, that's the same with Uber, like yeah. getting a stranger's car and pay them money. Yep. Airbnb, going to a stranger's house and pay them money. That all sounds stupid until it became part of the, the culture. One of my mentors, Alan Nation, used to tell me, Ty, if you tell your next door neighbor your idea and they like it, it's too late. Too late. You want people going, Meh, and that's not sense. innovative. Yeah, can't, can't be. Yeah, it needs to be a little weird. Um, sometimes I say stuff, and people are like, "Ty, that's just weird." And I always, this is how you shut down anybody who calls you weird. Just say, "Well, it's kind of like Albert Einstein said: the thing about smart people is they sound weird to dumb people." 
I'm telling you, that shuts people up instantly. First That's of all, it's like a backhanded are, slap. Uh, and uh, then insult. people go, "Are you calling me dumb?" I'm like, "No, I didn't say anything." Einstein it's called like a you very dumb. Subtle insult. Yeah. Can you can you argue? So a lot of people see Airbnb and HSMC and what what yeah. you're teaching, and they go. Oh, that's a little too weird. I'm going to stick with traditional real estate investing. Mm -hmm. No problem. I mean, there's still money to be made in real estate investing. But yeah. think about this. Real estate investing all hinges on income at the end of the day. It's all cash flow. That's it's, why all cash it's all flow. cash flow. Even if you're flipping, mm -hmm. it's still cash flow. So you got to ask yourself, how do I stay on the cutting edge? Because mm -hmm. if you study the last hundred years of world history, who got the richest? It's always people on the cutting edge. Like I said, Rockefeller became the richest man basically of the last thousand years by seeing oil before everyone else. Carnegie mm -hmm. became the second richest man by going, we're going to need steel to build railroads and to build everything now is steel. Your car is made out of steel. Mm -hmm. um, Elon Musk said, now let's take it a little further. We're going to need electric cars. Mm -hmm. that recharge themselves without using fuel. And he looked like an idiot for he many years. Like an and idiot. everybody, every I remember major reading, company is jumping I remember in. reading an article in 2009. It was like Wall Street Journal. And they were just laughing at this guy, Elon Musk. Well, you know, space travel looks stupid. Now Jeff Bezos is going, we're going to have to all go to space one day because there are going to be too many people on planet Earth. Everything looks dumb. And I tell people, yep. get in. You don't have to be the first. Yeah. Actually, being the first is dangerous because some weird ideas are actually stupid. Yeah. Right? But this Airbnb thing, you can Google it. People Magazine had an article on the guy in London who made $15 million in 2017. That's years ago. Yeah. Well, there, I, the article that got me all uh, jacked up and excited about this was in Forbes. It said the 75 people who make a million dollars or more a year on Airbnb. And that article just 75, 75. And that was written in 2016. Wow. I still talk about it, but it was written in 2016. That number is now in the hundreds. Yeah. And, and, uh, I was like, how do you make mil a million dollars on Airbnb? And it, I just, it just caught my attention. I didn't sleep that night because I, yeah. that was where I first really started getting excited about it when I read that. And, and one of the things that, that you teach, you, you, you teach people a lot of different things, but a lot of the, the core th theme I see across all the things that you teach is learning how to ride the coattails of these multi-billion dollar companies. Yes. So for example, yep. Amazon, you can make money on Amazon. Yep. You can make money on Facebook, doing yep. an agency. You can make money with Airbnb and we don't have to create a company like that. We can simply find a way to make money inside that yes. platform. Because Airbnb has invested literally billions in their website. So mm -hmm. the cool thing about this is if you've been in the real estate game or haven't been and you're like, I don't want to learn how to build a website. I don't want to learn how to do social media marketing. Yeah. You go, Airbnb has it all done for you. Mm -hmm. Literally, their site's not going to go down. It's backed by the best programmers. It's a yeah. redundant server. It's like all here ready for you to go. You've got legitimacy too. Yeah. Because that's the other thing. Imagine if there was no Airbnb and you just made your own website and you go, are you in Chicago? Want to stay in my one bedroom condo? Well, I've got people that approached me and said, hey, what do you think about this website I made? It's kind yeah. of like Airbnb. I was like, why? No. What are you doing? Yeah. And you sound a little <laughs> bit like you're like serial killer. Um, hey, I've got this basement for rent. Bring your friend and uh, I'm going to have to blindfold you when we walk down because I don't want you to see where you know, People aren't going to do that. But Airbnb, people are just going, all you have to literally do if you've listened to this is take good pictures. Yeah. Light the thing up, get a bagel, eat half of it, put the other half on a plate, <laughs> drink coffee. Like, and, and people are such procrastinators. I just go, well, well, I think a lot of people that look at a lot of businesses think, I don't know if I could do that. And the thing about this is if you can operate an app on your phone, it's the simplest app to operate. And if you've ever rented a property before in your life, which I would say most people have, unless they're very, very young, then you already know how half of it works. Yeah. It's not rocket science. If you've slept in a bed in your life, you can literally... You're qualified. Yeah, but you can break down what do people want. They want a bed. They want sheets that are clean. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of the common sense is no longer common, but if you're watching this and you're 18 years old, you can do it. No one cares. Yeah. First of all, they don't see you. That's why I always tell people about e-com yeah. and selling on Amazon or e-com because I get people who follow me who are... 14 years old, you know, there's mm -hmm. a kid, seven years old, he made um, YouTube publish the numbers, $22 million. He's got the Ryan's Toys. Is the unboxing? Ryan's kid? Toys. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He's cut a deal. He's seven. <clears throat> yeah. I'm going, what the hell was I doing at seven? 
I was like playing with Legos or something. And this guy was controlling $20 million business. But that's what's happening in the world. And so to be good at this business, you basically have to just reverse engineer psychology. Yeah. I'm in a new city. I want to stay somewhere. I'm going to go to Airbnb if, I, if I'm not a big fan of hotels or often it's cheaper than hotels. Well, I get a three bedroom place for what I pay for yeah, a room. Yeah. So I type it in. What am I looking for? Because I was literally just looking on Airbnb because I moved to London part time and I wanted to get Airbnb for my staff. Mm -hmm. And it was the same thing. I was looking through there and I was and like, you're scrolling fast. Yeah. So you're looking at the Some first people photo. people have like two photos on their thing. I'm going, how much harder is it to take five photos? Really? I'm like looking through it and I'm going, this person, this person actually took their phone, took two and said, yeah, that's it. It's going to be way too hard to shoot two more. <laughs> so you, by the way, how many pictures do you think you should take? Uh, well, Airbnb does max out how many they'll allow you to take, but, like but it's still quite a few. Eight or I, 10. I think they allow like 24 pictures. Yeah. So you want to put as many as you can. Yeah, you want to, and, and some, not just of the property. Yeah, you want to take some of the what's outside, around it. Exactly. Like, like what's the coolest bar nearby? Take a photo yes. of it and tell them why they should go to that bar. Uh, what's the biggest attraction in your city? Tell, tell them it's three minute walk. Yep. You know, those kind of things. And write a decent description that yeah. if, the, if it has a t rooftop terrace, put that in. Yeah. If it's, you know, we're, now, Rick, who's doing the sound here, we got him an Airbnb. Remember when I went to the uh, All-Star game in New Orleans a couple years ago? <laughs> Rick, so don't do this. <laughs> Rick gets there. It wasn't in a crack house or heroin. Close enough. It was. An, he got an opium den. From, it was literally. He got there. But you know the good thing is Airbnb refunded it. Yeah, took care. And of it. so <clears throat> people feel protected. Like yeah. I never stopped using Airbnb after that bad experience because I went. They made it right. Mm -hmm. So you're riding the coattails of good customer service. Yeah. Um, are there any other websites? that people should even remotely consider? VRBO. I mean, VRBO, but only for a very select part of the market. And I, I really believe that all you need to learn is Airbnb. It's, it's, let's talk advanced then. Okay, sure. Luxury. All right. The big money. Because yep. you're, you and your business partner have gone and gone. You know, it's like white belt. You got, you got your white, white belt. White belt, black belt. You got your white belt, your brown belt. Yeah, my black belt is like luxury stuff. My business partner was a student. Okay. He, he's a student who went through the program. and Went through your program? Went through my program. Yeah. Okay. So and the then, student and then, became And then later partner. on, he, he told me the results and I was quite jealous actually because he got his, uh, his first luxury property. This was in Scottsdale, Arizona, and he did over 100000 net. From one property. One. Good thing is, you must be a good teacher because when the students pass the teacher, it's actually good. I'm proud of it. I mean, people people ask when me Yoda about... When Yoda gets beaten in uh, by Luke... <laughs> who beat... Did anyone ever beat Yoda, Luke Skywalker? <laughs> Obi-Wan. Obi-Wan, yes. Then, yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, I know I have students that have done way more than I have, and that's that's exciting. You said you've got a few that are doing over a million dollars. I got, I got one guy that um, I've consulted with. I, I don't think he went through my program, but he's doing like two and a half million. Two of my students are approaching a million. And then I have countless people that are 100,000, 300,000. Are we talking net or gross? Net. I always talk net. about net numbers. Yeah. So 100, 200, 700,000, lots of those. So yeah. luxury properties. Once so, people get some, you don't recommend people okay, start Okay, don't luxury. jump into luxury properties yeah. because you're talking about a luxury, first of all, a luxury homeowner is not going to be just like, sure, you know, they're, yeah. they're going to take some extra convincing and some extra protection and they're going to want you to guarantee that $8,000, $12,000 rent payment. So. Yes. You have to be very careful going into that market, and I wouldn't recommend starting there. But there is a potential in the luxury market because most people don't know this. Most luxury properties in the U.S. are not lived in. Yeah. So I live in Charleston, South Carolina, and, and there's a place called South Abroad. Mm -hmm. Just magnificent southern mansions down there. And when you walk around down there, it's like a ghost town. The only mm -hmm. people you see is other tourists walking around. And I asked somebody that one time. I said, why is there nobody living in here? And they said, oh, these are all second, third, fourth homes for yeah. people. Nobody lives here. Yep. Like 80% of these homes are just empty all the time. So you'll find that in other luxury markets like Scottsdale, Arizona, a lot of those properties are vacant and they're sitting there not making any money for the owner. And the owner knows probably that you, they can make money on VRBO or Airbnb, but they don't want to be bothered with it. So you can approach them and do a deal with them where you partner with them or where you... So you can it. either partner or do... You can do the same thing. Do you think the economics... Let's just talk about this. By the way, this is one of the things that Brian teaches in his advanced mm -hmm. course. Yep. With what we taught you just in this, you know, one or hour or so um, conversation, you can actually go out and start. For those of you who want, I always say about 20% of people want help. If you want Brian's help, 
Go to tylopez.com slash Brian P, B-R-I-A-N-P. Click or click the link below if you're watching it. Um, and it's going to redirect you to his book and also a place where you could potentially become one of his students where he'd walk yeah. you through it this. It just depends on if you want to go faster and you want to yes. uh, potentially... It's safer. It's a little safer. safer. It's always safer to go with I it. always pay for speed. You know, I, yeah. I'm willing to pay money if I can go faster. And yeah, that's by leveraging expertise. And there's a lot of people, I mean, I see people going, oh, you don't need mentors. You don't need coaches. I go, well, if that's true, why does LeBron James have a coach? Yeah. Best basketball athlete. Why did Michael Jordan have a coach? Most talented players in the game. Yeah. Why did, why does Warren Buffett, who made $80 billion in the stock market and in the investing world, why did he work under Benjamin Graham mm -hmm. for four years? Well, actually about eight years. Mm -hmm. Warren Buffett has a very high IQ. And he didn't think he could do it on his own. But now we live in a very cocky world. So if you're one of those cocky people who are like, I don't need a mentor. By the way, this video was your mentor. But if you want advanced mentoring, tylopez.com slash Brian P. And let's talk about this advanced market. Sure. Because you go into a property. Let's say it's not super. I mean, I come from Manhattan in LA and London, you can get properties that are $150,000 a month. Don't start with $150,000 a month. Yeah. Those people will not let you put it on Airbnb. Yeah. Um, but let's just say you find a $10,000 in Hollywood Least, Hills yeah. right now. You can find, this is actually, for those of you who got a little more savvy, I, you go into Hollywood Hills is a great place. Now. I almost got one in, in West Hollywood. I have one. Yeah, well, you know whose I house? I don't use Airbnb. You know whose house I almost got? Who? Neil Patel. There you go. I was sitting down with him and he said, I want to move out of my house. And what do you think it would make on Airbnb? And I started showing him the numbers and he didn't believe me. I was like, no, dude, you can make some money with this house. Because yeah. he wanted to move out of it and turn it into a, an Airbnb once he started you talking You can to me. easily. So like, here's the math in my head. Tell me if I'm wrong. You can control a property, decent one, let's say for $10,000, mm -hmm. $12,000 a month. Yep. Okay. Or even less, you know, seven, eight thousand. Still, but I'm saying like luck. a nice, yeah, pretty yeah. nice one in a prime location. In a major city, yeah. You could definitely average a thousand bucks a night, and let's say you rent it out just twenty nights. Yeah, twenty nights. Not even trying to go hundred percent occupancy. Mm -hmm. Averaging some nights doing it seven hundred. Twenty yeah. is sixty-five percent. Yeah, yeah seven hundred and some nights on the weekend fifteen hundred. So you average a thousand. So you're gonna make twenty G's on a place that's ten or twelve. That's about eight thousand net. Yeah. After you take five percent for management. Mm -hmm. So, so I don't know of any real That's estate deal grand. where you could you could literally do that in one move. You could do a six figure net cash yeah. flow that lasts for years. One property. In one move. And if you're a little bit more fear based, you could go to the owner and mm -hmm. say, "Listen, you get hundred percent of the first ten grand, yep. and after that, we split it 50 50. Yep. So let's say you get twenty, and and he gets the first ten, or she gets the first ten. You're making five. Yep. That's sixty thousand a year. The average American makes fifty-one thousand. The average household yep. in America is making fifty-one grand with one property that you don't own. Yeah. If it gets destroyed, in that case, you don't. They're kind of your business partner. It's so, crazy. So we got properties in. We got properties in Arizona. We're looking at seventeen luxury properties in Florida right now. Yeah. As a group, Florida's good. So we're working on Florida. But Miami's a little weird, but you can go outside of Miami. But but here's the thing for everybody listening. I don't want you to get overwhelmed by the thought that that you have to do that because you can always start small. You can yeah. start with a studio or one better. Start with a room. Prove in your that own it works. Place. Start with a room in your own place. Yeah. yeah. And then prove that it works, and then start moving up. And if you want to do. Um, a significant income like that with four or five or six properties, it's it's just as easy to do if you manage it properly. Yeah, that luxury one is for those of you more so who already have real estate experience yeah. and so on. Now, a couple of other things, little devil advocate things. Mm -hmm. um, what if people say, got it, I heard you, it all makes sense. I'm just afraid, I'm just afraid because humans are emotional, okay? Yeah. How do you get over... What's the best technique to get over that little teeny hump? Because I find once people get started, that's the whole, you know, I made this course in 2014 called the 67 Steps. It's mm -hmm. a paid Great. program. About 100, almost 200,000 people have gone through the paid program. Yep. Okay. What I told people is in, what scientists have found is the average person, after about a little over two months, a new habit is formed. It's not hard. Mm -hmm. So, for example, Alex, my business partner, um, he just sold his company for $300 million. He's a machine at business and making money. But health-wise, he he, he moved down to L.A. because 
we, when we became business partners. And he was eating, I kid you not, three meals from Fat Burger, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Okay. Oh. I calculated he's eating 5,000 calories a day of junk food. He's not a big guy either. He's not like yeah. Arnold Schwarzenegger, you know, 5,000. So I'm going, Alex. I think you're gonna die here. You, it's like, yeah. You're like just cementing your arteries. So I said, come work out with me. He's like, ah, working out, it's a waste of time. I could sit in front of my computer and make more money. I said, yeah, but just try it. It took me years. Finally, I got him. Once about two months of just taking small action. At first, I just said, come out when I'm in the gym and talk to me. Mm -hmm. Don't work out. So he came out in the gym. He would, he would bring his laptop. I'm in the gym. This is how I'm getting rewiring his brain. Okay. He doesn't like to admit this, but, but rewiring his brain that the gym is a happy place, so mm -hmm. to speak. So he's making his money. Then I resorted to different psychological tricks. I was working out and you know, when your biceps are pumped, they look a lot bigger. I said, Alex, come over here. And I took a tape measure and I measured his arms and he had 11 and a half inch biceps. There was a girl there. <laughs> And I measured, she had bigger arms than him. And I said, Alex, you just, he's very competitive. I said, you just, you just can't have this small woman stronger than you. And all of a sudden he's like, so next day we were, I work out there. He doesn't have the habit yet, but it's about two weeks in. He grabs a weight, starts lifting. Next thing you know, he's a machine. He's the most, after two months, he works out like a robot now. And so I tell people, if you want to get in the Airbnb business, What's the minimum barrier to entry? Maybe stay in an Airbnb yourself. Next stay, time you go somewhere, stay in one yourself. Stay in Airbnb. See the experience. Try then it. the next one is like you said, get a little room. There's Rent no commitment. Yeah, you could say, all right, this weekend I'm going to list my spare bedroom or someone else's spare bedroom. I got, yes. I got a, a, you know, uncle over here that's got a spare room, whatever, and just make a little bit, a few hundred bucks yeah. on the weekend and test make it out. It's always the first dollar. It's like any business. Yes. It's the hardest hurdle is that first dollar. I tell people, make your first hundred. Once you figure that, go up by one, one, more, one more zero. The first thousand. Yep. Once you know how to consistently make your first thousand, try for 10,000. Exactly. And then you can stop there. You can try to go to 100,000. Now, yep. one cool thing about Airbnb, I don't know if you've explored this, but if you're afraid to rent out a room, there's all kind of the weird stuff. Like... Oh, I love you can about do this. a tree house is yeah. one of the most in-demand things. So, so in lucrative. a parking lot. You can rent yeah. out your backyard for a tent. You can do an Airstream trailer or an RV. Yeah. There's a lot of money in RVs because they don't cost anything to, to either rent or buy. You could buy an Airstream if you want to buy one for five grand and rent it for 150 a night. Or find or, everybody. Or rent it from somebody. Like, yeah, hey, somebody much... has your, your junky little. But have you seen this thing where like parking lots will like rent out and people yep. put tents there for like a festival? Yeah. I don't, know if Airbnb, has... I don't know if Airbnb does spaces, do they? I thought they, they did like campgrounds. They do boats. You can do yachts and boats. Yeah. yeah. That's possible. And then somebody did an igloo in New York City and then they removed it. <laughs> but I thought that was kind of a genius. Somebody was did thinking. Did it melt? Is that what No, happened? no, no. The, the website said you can't do igloos. Oh. <laughs> they, they, had had to, to, they had to write out their policy. They had to go to their lawyers. <laughs> uh, uh, What's our policy on igloos? <laughs> okay. But tree houses are literally in there. Are they still allowed? They're super lucrative. There's a book uh, called The Airbnb Story. I think you reviewed it once. Yeah. Uh, they, uh, the, the, the owners, uh, Brian Chesky, said the most profitable thing you can do right now is go build a tree house. So grab some two by fours, <laughs> nail it to a tree, and be like, when people that's come, two boards, like, that's it. you thought you were getting a room? Here you go. <laughs> Climb, my friend. It's a pillow on a Definitely board. Definitely get extra insurance. You got to go to the insurance people and be like, uh, do you have treehouse insurance? Do you have falling insurance? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Somebody break. Yeah, I don't know if I would do that one, but I like the idea of post on your social media. Who has an extra room? Want to make some money. Yeah. Everybody in this world is always broke. So if you go, who wants to make some money? Somebody will reply. Yeah. Number one thing that will get you replies is who wants some money? Yeah. My parents have a, a couple spare rooms. I don't, but you know. If, if I was starting out from scratch and I didn't have a room, I'd just look to anybody that I know and say, look, let me put that room on there. Just test it out. We'll what do you do if people are psychos? Uh, you know, for a long time, I, I was allowing people to stay in my spare room on Airbnb. Yeah. So I met all, all types. Any horror um, stories? No, no horror stories. There were a couple weird people, but I didn't have anything like, you know, I did lock my door at night a couple times. <laughs> Here's my raw my lather. Own, I'll be here in my room with my pit bull. Just show them my, my gun collection before they go to sleep, you know. Uh, no, not, not, no real bad stories, but, um, 
you know, if you don't feel comfortable doing that, ask anybody if they've got rental property and say, hey, look, yeah, why don't we try this instead of what you're doing right now? The next time something comes vacant, let me put it on Airbnb. I guarantee if you ask people, somebody you know has rental property. Oh, yeah. So and that you don't have to do it in your own home. In your own block, there's people with properties for sale. I yeah. love the idea of going, if you go on Zillow or different websites, mm -hmm. you can search them, by, especially if you have a realtor friend, say, show me all the stale listings. Yep. Things that's been on this market for 12, 14 months. It's usually overpriced or something's weird about the property. Yep. Go into those property. Go on a on a Sunday when they're doing an open house and be like, hey, I got something crazy for you. Let me rent this thing out on the weekdays. Yeah. You've And you know a good thing to do is tell people how much money they've lost. So let's say it's been on the market for 12 months. You say, I don't want to be rude here, but I just did a quick calculation in my head. I think I can rent this thing out for and pay you i don't know three grand a month or something like that yeah and you this place has been sitting here and that's just on the weekdays you can still show it on the weekends mm -hmm. that's thirty six thousand you've left on the table this yep. year thirty six thousand this is if you really want to convince somebody you go thirty six thousand invested in the stock market at eight percent all right so eight percent roughly means that it'll double every nine or 10 years. Mm -hmm. And let's say they're 30 years old. Yeah. You go five doublings before you're retired, four doublings, let's say. Mm -hmm. This 36,000 would be 72, 140, 208. You left behind <laughs> a quarter of a million dollars from not letting me rent this of potential. Mm -hmm. People go, you want to stop losing 200? This might be on the market another year. Recession's That's a good one. Let me start making you some money. That's a good one. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know there's, if you've, there's you've opportunity used that everywhere. pitch. I've not used that one. That's On luxury not. properties? Oh. Where numbers. it's like 10, 15,000, you can be like, numbers every year insane. you're losing a potential one to two million dollars. By the way, this is the book, How to Become Financially Independent on Airbnb Without Owning Property by yours truly, Brian Page. You know who says yours truly now? If you guys watch Twitter, OJ has his own Twitter account. <laughs> Have you seen it? No. He goes, hi, Twitter world. It's yours truly. So never say yours truly unless you want to be associated with uh, OJ Simpson. Brian Page, <laughs> not yours truly. And um, so tylopez.com slash Brian, B-R-I-A-N-P, will redirect you to a link where you can get the book. And for those of you who want Brian's help to actually walk you through his training program, I always say about 20% of people really should do it with somebody. If you want Brian helping you get started, um, he's, you've taught a lot of people. I've partnered with him. He's trained um, some of my students with great results. So we'll have a link there too to get access to that. Whatever you do, main thing from this talk we did today, take action. Don't be somebody who looks back at their life and like Thoreau said, the mass of men lead lives of quiet desperation. What's called resignation is confirmed des desperation. Meaning anytime you listen to something, you go, that's a good idea. I should probably do it. And then you resign yourself to just going, oh, but I don't know if I have time. You're basically confirming your desperate life. Never be desperate. Desperate people, nobody wants to date them. Nobody wants to be around them. You start building up that desperation and the habits of the mind uh, lock in. Warren Buffett says, the chains of habit are too weak to be felt until they're too strong to be broken. So every time you listen to something like this and you don't actually do it, you're actually rewiring your brain to being somebody who listens and doesn't do. Mm -hmm. And all the wealth is created by people who do. It's better actually to be sloppy, but actually do stuff than to be a perfectionist and never get off the ground. I mean, this world, if you look at Facebook was built, the youngest billionaire of our times is Mark Zuckerberg. He's worth over 60 billion in his 30s. He said, go so fast, you break stuff. Mm -hmm. So I'll give you that advice from somebody worth $60 billion. Airbnb, go so fast, things break a little bit. Like, it's okay if somebody wakes you up at two in the morning and says, the toilet's clogged. You'll look back one day, if you have no war stories, nobody respects you. It's kind of like UFC. I was at the UFC fight, Nate Diaz came back out of retirement. When you look at Nate Diaz's face, when you look at, you know, Khabib or Conor McGregor, these guys have war scars. You believe that these guys have been in the trenches fighting. Don't be afraid 
and go, well, Ty, how can I do Airbnb and have no war, you know, no war stories? You want a war story. Yeah. There's nothing better. Like people that don't respect me, there's people that will always respect you. There's people that don't respect me. When they actually meet me and they hear my story, they're like, wait a second, I respect you now because you have war stories. And so never pause because there's going to be a little bit of risk. If there's no risk, there ain't no money. <laughs> this is how the game goes. Mm -hmm. You know, like they say in uh, Las Vegas, scared money don't make money. The people who make money in Vegas put the money down on the table. They do calculated bets, not stupid ones. Mm -hmm. This is a very calculated bet. You've done it. Thousands of people have done it. And it just kind of makes sense. It's Airbnb. It's not how to start, you know, a Ponzi scheme. Okay. <laughs> so jump in. For sure, get the book. If you're going to do it on your own, at least get the book. I think everybody listening who this resonates with, get the book. Tylobiz.com slash Brian P or click the link below. If you need a little extra help beyond the book, sign up for the course. It's not that expensive. Last time I checked, um, I met this girl in New York and she's doing digital marketing degree, she told me. I said, oh really? That's, she didn't know that I have a background in marketing. She said, ah. I said, okay, how much are you spending? Pace College, I think, in New York. She said, it's 30 grand and four year degree. I went, wow, you're gonna devote 30 grand and four years of your life to learning some for some professor who's never even done a Facebook ad himself. She goes, oh no, no, it's 30 grand a year. Mm. I said, 120,000 to learn from ding dongs and never done it. Well, your course is not 120 grand. No. So the book is, I don't even know how much, but it's not expensive. Free, free plus shipping. Oh, free plus yeah. shipping. Yeah. And then the course is whatever. Whatever it is, you get what you pay for. So for those of you who get this, jump in Brian's course, get the book at the minimum, literally, you just pay the shipping costs. So, Brian. All right. Thanks for coming, man. Thank you, brother. Yeah. Appreciate it.